the Wild Feather Podcast. I'm Brooke Dunwell, serial entrepreneur, sponge for life, and lover of people. Join me as we uncover the stories of courageous female entrepreneurs, founders, and investors pushing beyond limitless boundaries. Let's explore their creative journeys and pursuits to greatness. Stephanie Sarka is joining us today. Stephanie Sarka is the founder and CEO of One at a Lear, which is a direct-to-consumer custom luxury handbag brand. She is a seasoned entrepreneur with deep experience in building businesses and brands such as Coach, a paid search company that was bought by Yahoo, and she has amazing stories of living overseas and doing some fantastic things with brands. She's smart, she's resilient, she's witty, and she's bringing the joy and fun back into luxury. Thanks, Stephanie, for joining us today on the podcast. We're so excited to have you here. I've been looking forward to this. Yay. Um, So I would love um, you to share your journey. You have a fascinating background and have done a variety of things um, and been involved in larger companies and startup companies. And now you have your own company. So kind of give us some background about your I guess your career path <laughs> and how it morphed into being a founder. And, you know, I always say when you're, when you're an angst at 20 or 25 or even 30, you know, what am I going to do when I grow up? What's my path? You always wish you could have a camera to zoom forward and see where it lands. Cause it's so much easier to connect the dots looking backwards. Um, so when, you know, today sitting where I am, if I look backwards and connect the dots, you know, the germs or the seeds of, um, of uh, being a founder and an entrepreneurial and innovator go way, way back. I can even point to, you know, events I was creating in under in high school and I guess junior high school, Lavin Rack, which was, it's actually carnival spelled backwards, but a carnival that we initiated at my high school that was instituted by myself and um, uh, various sort of selling initiatives, you know, small, but nonetheless. Um, and even in college at Stanford, I was involved in various entrepreneurial organizations and efforts. I was part of ISEC, which is all about um, young entrepreneurs sort of going cross-border and working with other companies. Um, I, after college, did go to Wall Street more because I was just looking for that extraordinary experience. And I was at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I was fortunate to be in the mergers and acquisitions department for two reasons. One, um, I quickly knew that I am a builder, not a banker. <laughs> um, but two, I was sitting at the table across from these organizations whom we were learning about in order to package them up and sell them. And just thought those people are having so much fun. And my favorite part of the work was the due diligence trips where we would go in and you know, we were selling YSL or we were selling, um, right, the YSL brand for, um, I think it was Squib. It was a large pharmaceutical company that owned it. I, I'm forgetting now. And here I was kicking the tires and walking through this huge cosmetic factory in the south of France. And, you know, they were pumping out perfumes and lipsticks. And so the due diligence was enormous fun. And I would get to meet the management and we would interview the management to understand their business. And I just ended up recognizing quite quickly that that's where I belonged was really on the operating side of the table. Um, So actually before even going to business school, I went to France and I took a job with a fragrance company with IFF, International Flavors and Fragrances. Uh, Had an incredible year. You know, my salary was reduced by 75% and I was living in a (laughs) illegal Chambre de Bonne right there in the sixth arrondissement and uh, talked, had the year of my life. Definitely proved, at least at that age, you don't need money to have fun. Right. Um, and, it's you know, and I was, oh, and it was France, it was Paris, right? And I was really um, fortunate that they gave me a lot of responsibility to really run the marketing department for this organization in France and traveling all over the European continent then working with clients. And at that point, I said, okay, this is where I belong. I ended up at HBS and my focus was mostly on the entrepreneurial track. It's so interesting now because I was graduate in 1990. So you do the math, you'll get to a general sense of my age. Um, being an entrepreneur was not the thing in the nineteen, yeah. you know, in 1990. Today, VCs are backed into the parking lot just waiting for those graduates to 
graduate and give him their business <laughs> right? plan. It's true. A uh, whole new world. <laughs> but um, but I came out and I was, uh, again, super fortunate to land a coach with a, a job with Coach Leatherwear. Um, and my mentor to this day, Lou Frankfurt, who was um, the gentleman running coach when it had been spun off by Sarah Lee, or excuse me, it had been bought by Sarah Lee. They subsequently spun it off when it had been bought by Sarah Lee. And it was a really small company then, you know, it was a hundred and some million dollars and it was in a huge growth trajectory and he took me under his wing and I just got to see every aspect of running a business. You know, it wasn't a huge business. It wasn't a baby business either. Um, whether it was selling or tanning leather or production of the bags on the factory floor, I loved going to the factory and just seeing the bags in production or pushing me behind a sales counter and telling me I had to meet customers and sell the product. Um, and ultimately, we bought a company called Mark Cross, which I got to lead, and it was a turnaround and a successful one, although at some point, Coach decided it was not a good strategic fit um, for various reasons. But um, all of those things really started adding up. And, and on some levels, I was an entrepreneur running Mark Cross, but with the backdrop of Coach, which, right. you know, so I wasn't really worried about funding and budget. I was certainly worried about making my numbers. But so when when Mark Cross, when Coach decided that he needed to excuse me, it needed to peel Mark, when Coach decided they needed to actually close Mark Cross and they ended up retaining the assets for other reasons, I just said, okay, this is my moment to jump. And, you know, you're young, you're single. And so uh, this is now the late 90s, the internet thing is starting to happen. And I just started throwing my name out in the hat, mostly in California to see what people were doing. Um, and I spoke to, I mean, gosh, companies, you know, uh, Zip2, I think, was it Zip2, which was um, Elon Musk's, one of his first companies, oh. right? I don't even know. If, maybe I met him. Who knows? Um, <laughs> and Yahoo, you know. Right. And um, Did you say, I think I remember you telling me that you reached out to everyone in your network that you everyone possibly looking for opportunities, which I thought was great. I don't think a lot of people do that. You know, that's one of the many secrets is that I will tell you that most of my career has been through the network. And Harvard certainly dramatically expanded that network, HBS. That's kind of why you go to business school on many levels. Um, Or at least that's why you go to HBS on many levels. (laughs) Um, So ultimately, I landed at Ideal Lab with um, uh, incredible Bill Gross, who's just an incredibly fascinating guy. And they were flirting with this idea and it was a brilliant concept. Why are people paying for banner ads on the top of search when the search results are what people are looking for? So why don't we figure out a way to monetize the search results? And so four of us invented the paid search business model. I mean, literally I still keep a big piece of paper where we were whiteboarding um, that has the basic fundamentals of the business model as we work through it. That's so, incredible. I mean, heady times, you know, we had, we had many, I don't think we all knew what we were doing. I don't think I knew what I was doing. Um, in those early days as the internet was just starting to hit. But, you know, we got lucky and we had an incredible support with not only Bill, but a number of other investors and um, three other incredible co-founders. So those four years were transformative on so many levels. They were transformative because it became so crystal clear the power of the internet and turning virtually any business model on its head. Um, And also because um, I uh, was having so much fun, working so hard, but had never had so much fun and pretty much redefined what my future would look like. So came back to New York, spent a few years thinking it was time to, you know, get married and have a baby. <laughs> we'll right. talk about that later. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I left, when I left the company, which was called goto.com and then it was rebranded as Overture, uh, one of our senior women said, okay, just go out and get a life, you know, like you have married your business for the last four years, go out and get a life. And I took her to heart. I almost use it as an excuse not to work like, okay, I really need to get a life, you know, (laughs) So I was out just having a good time traveling all over the world. You know, I built a beautiful apartment here in New York and, uh, but I was sprinkling fairy dust all over the place. I was an advisor, an investor, a board member. I had, I was on the board of a luxury brand called Tanner Curl in London. I helped launch what's become a very large, um, ad tech company in China. Uh, so I was working all over the globe and working really hard and many, many hours a week uh, while I was you know, supposedly trying to get married or at least trying to have a baby or have a life. Exactly. And at some point I just thought, wow, I'm working really hard and, you know, for a lot of other people and sort of sprinkling fairy dust all over the place. Why don't I just take more of that fairy dust and more of my time and put it towards something of my own? Yeah. 
That's so that awesome. brings us to an atelier. I love it. That's awesome. So tell us about one atelier. So one atelier is, was originally a passion project. I, I have to be honest. Um, not that it wasn't ever intended to be a big business, but it was really, I guess, you know, the classic entrepreneur's dilemma trying to solve a problem. And my problem was that I was prepared to invest in um, luxury product in terms of quality and workmanship, but I had really gotten past the point. I'm not sure I've ever was really there in a big way, but where I needed to project someone else's brand for whatever stature or elevation it provided for me. Um, in fact, I had a quite a visceral reverse reaction to that. And I was struggling to find, especially accessories that mapped to that desire. Hmm. Um, but it went beyond that. So that was the early stages where I started thinking, gosh, where's a brand where I can, you know, I want that brand, but with the gold hardware, I want that bag, but with the red, not the black. And that just didn't exist, especially in the luxury category. There were a few wanky brands out in the, I guess, the lower end of the spectrum. So started flirting with the idea, shopping it, bringing in women into my living room to do focus groups. Um, bumped into one of my co-founders through an introduction who's really one of the few remaining master crafts people in the country, probably in the world in luxury. And we started playing with the idea. He brought in another colleague, um, who ultimately became a founder as well. And, and that colleague, I had actually worked with a coach. It turned out we had known each other, but we were on different floors and different business model, business areas. Um, and as we started pounding through the idea, you know, two or three other things really rose to the surface that we wanted to resolve. One was that the joy had been completely squashed out of luxury. And so for me, there's nothing more important than, um, than bringing the joy back to luxury and really demonstrating that joy. So you'll see most of our models are smiling. Whenever we're shooting, I'm like, where's the smile? Where's the joy? You know. <laughs> uh, but, but for me, it's Love. about having fun. It's about self, it's about some kind of self-manifestation. It's about that moment in your life when you can take a breath and be creative and put everything else aside for a minute and just enjoy the process as well as the outcome. And as a luxury consumer, that had certainly been lost for me. And as I spoke to other women, it became increasingly clear that that had been lost for other people. And I guess related to that was one of the things that most of us want is just to celebrate ourselves and to express things that are meaningful to us. And so related to the joy was um, really giving us a platform to celebrate what makes each person original. Um, you know, we're big on originality from every angle and we have received such extraordinary feedback from clients in the way of notes written or digital that they have the, their, their finest moment with relation to our product, at least is when someone stops them in the street and says, who designed your bag? And they kind of hold it and say, I did. And that's why we built the brand. I mean, that gives me chills every time I hear that story because that's why we built the brand for women to get to celebrate themselves and have that joy of, of uh, being part of the process. It's a whole different kind of relationship with the luxury brand. And then I guess the last two things were uh, the business model in luxury is so broken uh, on every level, starting with just the, the distribution, the tier distribution strategy uh, where the value is going more to the retailers to the, than to the creators and the innovators. And, and lastly, you know, we don't have to say a whole lot because it's out there in such a big way right now, but the massive waste of the luxury category. So we started trying to bake these elements, you know, joy, originality, uh, new business model and sustainability. And the outcome was really custom and on-demand, custom design and on-demand manufacturing. Now, do you do your manufacturing in the States or is that in another country? No, it's all done on West 36th Street. Ah, oh, that's awesome. In Manhattan. That's cool. Yeah, we're going to have to move out of there soon. We're back to, we're getting closer to full capacity. And in fact, I'm going to have to bring a few guys back on now, which is awesome. I've been waiting for that moment. But I, we're already looking at probably a year. Our lease ends in May. And I'm going to guess we're going to need to find a new space somewhere out of the inner city where we can expand. Yeah. Now, when did you launch? So we had a soft launch in 2015, you know, only to find that some of the technology wasn't working as well as it should when we started getting traffic or trying to add new styles. So we kind of kept everything quiet and retooled uh, and then really started pushing on the brand in 2000, 2016. So we've been at it a few years and, you know, I look back, I was just doing that in my head today. I have to be honest there. My daughter climbed into my bed this morning and I'm 
wide awake kind of thinking, okay, gosh, here we are, it's 2021, <laughs> how did we get here? And I kind of can mark, because she's basically the same age as the business. So here's this long drink of water, you know, just turned seven. I'm thinking, wow, I've been working on this for like six years. Yeah. Um, but it's for two reasons, really. You know, the customer and the, the press and the buyers were not ready for custom. They just could not grok. We visited virtually every primary um, fashion editor. And it just was not mainstream and and they were not kind of getting the the joy and the glory of it. And I could say maybe it's because we weren't presenting it appropriately either. Um, Who knows? Uh, And certainly the sustainability conversation. I had customers Mm -hmm. and even buyers tell me that no one wants to talk about that. This is not part of the selling process for us. (laughs) You know, so... Yeah, I want to get on that for a minute because I don't think a lot of people are aware or they even think about it, right? So whenever you were telling me the stats or the numbers of the inventory that's held, so if it's not customized like yourself and you're not focused on sustainability, a normal, say, brand or handbag brand, we'll just say general, they're mass producing these products, right? And then Mm -hmm. what percent goes to retail? What percent goes to um, break that down for us? Because I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, certainly in the luxury industry, you know, 40% plus or minus is actually sold at full price in retail. Well, let me let, but let me back up. So you create a forecast. This is where the problem starts. You know, all (laughs) the forecast is the root of all evil. Um, And my other favorite saying is, you know, the only thing you know about a forecast is that it's wrong. So you start with a forecast and I've been part of that process, right? It's so intense and you're trying to take data from the past and seasonality and the best selling style and, and hours and hours and hours are spent on these forecasts that create then a open to buy or a unit forecast to purchase. And you end up with all this inventory because you've tried to account for, um, multiple doors and seasonality and best-selling styles. You know, this is happening. It's changing now dramatically, but this is happening four or five times a year in fashion, right? There's four or five Mm -hmm. seasons and there's multiple collections per season and each of those collections have a forecast. And there's, what are we going to sell? What do we need to have as presentation stock in the store? What do we need to have as back stock to make sure we sell? And if we don't have enough that we have the inventory, if we didn't forecast it adequately, we have the inventory so we don't have a stock out and miss a sale. So there's all these ways that are kind of goosing up the inventory. And then you have inventory at your own warehouse, at your retailer's warehouses and your retailer's shops and their stock rooms and on the shelves, just inventory everywhere. Um, and I know when I've been in retailers, when we've had our brand there um, in a different business model, which I'll come back to, I look around, I just no way who, who buys all this stuff. It's insane. Mm-hmm. So back to the figures. So in luxury, at least about 40% is sold at for full price, you know, maybe another 20% at some discount. Um, and the retailers are constantly discounting. And there's a lot of pressure on brands like ours, which aren't really wired to discount because we don't have to. Um, and then the balance has got to, you know, the favorite, the least favorite word for a brand is RTV, return to vendor, when the retailer wants to move the inventory. Either they're going to seriously liquidate it or they're going to have to try to find someone else to pawn it off on. If they're someone like Nordstrom or Saks Fifth Avenue or even Neiman's, I guess they all have their own second channels, which they can mm-hmm. use. Um, or you take it back as a brand and now you have to figure out what to do with that inventory. Um, and so it results in, I, I think the number is like t- 95 million tons of wasted product that hits landfills or or That's even less favorable demise in the course of a year. Yeah. So I think this is valuable information for those founders that are maybe starting their path on a product, you know, to think about, like, think about the sustainability and think about um, product not selling or, or, you know, it's something I doubt most founders think about when they're launching the brand, right? When they're, when they're putting product out there. And I think it's a viable topic to understand, you know, but you know what, what's, it's, what is a game changer for, so it's very hard for an existing um, brand, especially large ones to go to on-demand production, which really is the silver bullet. There's definitely things um, both upstream and downstream on the, on the whole sustainability or circular Mm -hmm. fashion circuit. Um, Everything from, you know, the ethical treatment and the environmental uh, processes of the, the sourcing of the leather and the tanning of the leather 
um, and the transit and use of carbon. Um, and then on the other end, as I said, the big push on recycling and, and reusing and reselling. But the whole, the real silver bullet is just not producing it. That has the biggest impact on the waste. Um, not the environmental necessarily, although yeah, it does too, because producing it creates environmental outcomes. And so when you talk about on-demand manufacturing, uh, A, larger companies, it's just hard for them to turn that boat because they're so built on mass production. So what you see them doing, and you're seeing it even, I just pulled out a, they've probably been doing it forever, but they're marketing it now, a page out of the New York Times from Ralph Lauren advertising that you can customize their polo shirt, you know, by choosing the different color blocking and what the insignia are on the mm -hmm. body and the arms. Um, and then they're saying it's on demand production and it's one of a time mm -hmm. and now we can, you know, be more sustainable. I'm like, boy, that's right out of our playbook. Right. So I'm glad we have that validation. But they can't run their entire business that way. So they're just peeling out their iconic style. And you see this everywhere. Gucci, many brands have pulled out the Fendi, their iconic style, and they run that one as a, as a made uh, on-demand production, but they really can't. So for startups, you know, you have a white, a clean slate. Right. Um, and for us, we are natively custom. We were built this way. Virtually every style in our, in our offering is custom. Um, and, has a, and it puts a dramatically lower burden on the investor or on the company for investment capital to buy raw materials and to produce finished goods that you sit in a warehouse and just let you know go to waste and that's that's sometimes how long does it take once you place your order how long does it take to get to receive it because i think my first thought process when you were talking about all of this is people always want immediate gratification right like they want it now so mm -hmm. if you're I think it's a different mindset that they just have to be accustomed to um, waiting for the valuable customized solution, right? And I think probably that's one of the challenges with the bigger brands, but we're so Amazon crazy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we get our stuff in two days, right? So what's the time process on that? We, we deliver within 21 days, but it's usually many days less. And the only reason we, in fact, usually it's within a week or two, we can ship a product in, or, in order. And the only reason we allow ourselves that window, which we'll be tightening here as we get bigger and start to scale, it allows us to do two things. One is our raw materials are brought in just in time. So if we have the skin or a few skins of a particular, we're not buying bulk skin against a forecast, remember lesson one. So if we happen to have some of that skin that we need, then we'll use it. If we don't, we'll place an order. And our we have some really nice relationships with tanneries in Italy where we can get just a handful of skins um, to map to what our immediate needs are in a matter of a few days, certainly within a week. And so if we find that we have to put an order in, we can do that. And that gives us a little bit of time to do that. And then the second reason we build in that extra time is to just bundle like styles. So we could have you know 15 universal satchels each of them is unique and different, but there's still economies in making the same style, even if each combination of materials is different. So we give ourselves a little window to accumulate multiple pieces of the same style. That said, um, you know, we're shipping usually within a week to 10 days. Um, and that's dramatically better, of course, than what you would get from either the Louis Vuitton or the Hermes comparable service, which would be, especially in the case of Hermes, and obviously it's for a whole different reason, which is massive demand. Um, as well as their process, you know, eight to 10 months. I think that's totally reasonable. Well, I think the client is demonstrating a very different mindset in the last several mm -hmm. months. A, there's a movement towards buying pieces that last and not having that constant circle of newness every, you know, three to four months. And so people are willing to wait a little bit more to get that piece that's going to serve them a couple of years. You're also seeing that there's an understanding of waiting. Even I go to the Bergdorf or Neiman sites and they have a lot more items up for pre-order. Um, so they're starting to be, they want to be able to feed a more uh, informed forecast over to their brands. And so pre-order allows them to do that. And so when you make a pre-order, clearly you're going to have to wait a little time. So there's just a shift in mindset for quality, you know, less of an it bag, more of a, a one a one of a kind piece that I can wear for a long time and that best reflects my taste and lifestyle. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so I want to talk about or hear about being a single mom 
So you're a single mom of a seven, eight year old, seven, eight. Yeah. She just just turned on seven a little bit ago. Seven, seven year old. So we all know how crazy being a founder is and um, the crazy life work balance thing, if there is such a thing. Um, So talk to us about your motherhood journey and how do you do this all alone? Yeah. Um, Well, I will say that uh, just to, to start, you know, she's my source of joy and inspiration. And Mm -hmm. I think it would be a lot harder without her because especially as a single person, um, maybe it's different if you have someone else to come home to. Um, but she is just a incredibly, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed to use the term my mom always used to say child. And, um, so that sets the context for everything else for me. And I have, so that's number one. Number two is, you know, when someone is home and you can't just lash out because you've had a bad day and stomp around and bang your fist on the table. Um, you know, I've had to really learn to just compartmentalize and, and manage my feelings and emotions, um, yeah. even when the day is really bad. But in terms of a day-to-day, and as you know, as an entrepreneur, there's great days and there's bad days, and it's kind of like a heart monitor. It's like this voice monitor I'm watching here on the screen. You know, <laughs> there's this going on, and I'm just trying to kind of maintain a much lower, m- smaller modulation, you know, even though mm-hmm. my life is more like this. And so she'll see a little of it, but she doesn't see the big swings up or down. Um, and actually, as a side note, you know, I'm really proud. She wants to be an entrepreneur and an inventor. And she's already named Aww. her company. She wants to call it Toy Joys or something. I love so, that. You know, hopefully I love had that an she's already thinking that. That's awesome. But in terms of the day-to-day, um, uh, you know, you're never not thinking about your company. So I just had to put really some pretty tight guard. Well, A, I have an incredible nanny. I'll start with that. And that's a fortunate situation. And she's converted to being teacher this year with my daughter in the other room and guiding her through her online program extremely well. So, you know, we just got lucky with an amazing person who has been with us for about six years now. Um, that's great. Secondly, uh, you know, I had to put really tight guardrails up around my life. So, I mean, I'm probably working 16 or 20 hours a day, probably not quite 20, but, um, but it's in all sorts of different ways. I have sort of shift one, which is um, the morning, you know, drop her off to school next year, for example, my office is close by, spend the day there, dash out of work like a crazy person at five o'clock, you know, <laughs> which is not who I am, but there I am. So I can get home to then spend a couple hours with my daughter, have dinner, read, bath a whole bit spend some time with her on her bed. And, um, and then I start shift two and that's where the thinking work happens and catching up on emails and maybe some of the bigger picture stuff or now we're working on an investor outreach. So trying to really draft a, the deck and the financials, the f- projections. Um, and then the weekends, you know, I have to say, this is where I think it breaks down a little bit for me and I'm just being honest. Um, there's so many weekends I wish I could just spend the next 24 to 48 hours working. There's so much to do and that's just not possible. Um, so I'll continue to do a little bit in the morning. I have things running along the day on my Slack channel and then I'll spend time at night. Um, but I've convinced myself and I do think this is true that I'm actually more productive and happier at work when I've had a good weekend with my daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I have seen other people in my life who just feel like, you know, you got to work hard. It's like that, like Woody the Pooh. Remember he would sit down and go, think, think, like force yourself to think and force yourself and just beating your head against the wall and beating your head against the wall. And that strategy does not work for me. Maybe it does for others. It does not work for me. <laughs> so I really do believe that stepping back and having some joyful moments and getting fresh air and having some frivolity and laughing. We laugh hysterically. She's a very funny kid. Um, so laughing uh, makes a difference. And I will add that I'm a big believer in the subconscious. And so many of my best thinking, my best ideas and my best thinking bubbles up because it's congealing right in the background, whatever you're doing, sleeping, playing, it's still happening. And then you'll open your laptop one morning. You'll go, oh my God, it just came to me. Um, I think that's so you need to allow happens. that to happen. You're allowing it to happen. Exactly. Cause you're letting go, surrendering and letting the universe deliver. Right. I love that. I also yeah. think that my belief is you're never going to get the time back with your daughter, right? Like once it's gone, it's gone. You can always work. So um, 
I agree with you about that whole weekend philosophy. Uh, I, I don't even, I've started, not that it matters, but I've started not even opening my email on the weekends. Like I don't, hmm. I shut it off once I pick my daughter up on Friday. Cause I'm a single That's mom. That's courageous. Mom, so <laughs> I, can, I can relate, but like, it is what it is, right? Like, I mean, I'm, nothing's going to get accomplished. I mean, other than sending emails back and forth, nothing can be that urgent, right? Unless yeah. anybody's hurt. I will say, though, that one thing I'm very aware of now is that I put a lot of time and even personal capital into this company. So I don't think I'm necessarily motivated by fear. I know a lot of people are. I'm motivated by something else, which we should talk about, because I think entrepreneurs have different motivations. But but I, if this thing were not to pull, you know, if we didn't pull it off in the end, it would. this would be hard for me to look back and think about the money and the time, most importantly mm -hmm. from her. Um, especially in the early days when she wasn't in school, that I have taken away. Whereas if it's successful, you know, it's a great story. I can justify all that. She's seen this woman work hard and succeed. Right. So that's probably what motivates me more than anything to make sure we pull this thing to the, you know, the finish line, whatever that may be. Yeah, I love that. Uh, so what do you want your legacy to be? So that's, that's sort of the, the, the question because I often think about why do entrepreneurs do things? Um, um, and I believe there's multiple reasons. One is fear um, of not succeeding. The second is um, there's some people who are just need that time in the limelight, uh, you know, ego, if you will. And it's an incredible way to get attention when you're an entrepreneur, especially a successful one. For me, it is about legacy. It's just about, how do I make an impact? How do I change things for the better um, mm -hmm. for humanity and just how things are done in general uh, for the planet? You know, increasingly that's a bigger part of our, it's a big part and an increasingly big part of our mission. Um, and so all that said, and I've said this all my life, my most important legacy will be my daughter. I think she's the, a reflection of, of pretty much everything my life is. Um, you know, I've always been independent, very independent, very um, sort of industrious and be, uh, marching to my own drum. And so having a child on my own was just, you know, <laughs> I didn't even blink at the idea. I did blink at the idea of a sperm donor bank. That was a little foreign for a few minutes. I was like, whoa, it's like match.com. This is weird. <laughs> but I got over it <laughs> just to put it out there. You know, <laughs> and then I realized... Now I can have the tall, dark, and handsome. And I was like, you can smart. pick what you want. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> so I figured out I was just going to, you know, if that's the consolation prize, then I'm going to go for it. And so I can <laughs> compensate for any of my have, flaws. like occupations and stuff in there? Like how detailed are those descriptions? Oh, very. And I actually <laughs> took it another step. They don't do this anymore. One, The one I was using, the applications were in handwritten. Oh. Now they're all typed in. I think they... So I had a, uh, is it called, is it a graphologist? A woman who reads handwriting, oh. for personality and temperament, and she was good. And so she was reading all these things, reading them from a handwriting perspective so that she could give me more information about their temperament and personality. Um, so that was my That's secret brilliant. weapon. That's brilliant. Um, and so far, as, you know, I mean, there are a few, there are a few characteristics. It's like when you have a husband, the same thing, like that is absolutely not coming from me, but <laughs> most of the good ones I'll take claim for. Um, so she, you know, but everything about her, she's, um, you know, and there's a lot of nature versus nurture conversation that goes on, but she's uh, incredibly strong-willed, a real independent thinker. Um, you know, anytime she starts to pursue something that she loves, she's a great singer and dancer. She's good with science and math. And I'll say, okay, let's do STEM camp this summer. Let's do, let's go audition for the New York City Ballet. Oh no, mom, they're going to take away all the fun. <laughs> well how do you get better if you don't you know i'm good i can dance it's okay <laughs> so um uh you know for me life no, no matter what i would have accomplished you know by 30 what by 40 you know we had taken go to public overture at the time and that had the success that everybody if you're in business or a startup would like you know we we were a unicorn before we were talking about unicorns so I've done that. I've had that. And yet if I had died without a child, I think it would have been a very sad life. So really she's the legacy yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, but I can say it's nice now that I have her to also know that 
you know, I love what I do. I love what I do. I walk in. I'm so happy to be back in with the team. I think we mastered remote, but I'm so we're not in full time. We have a hybrid model. Um, but it is a joy for me to work with these incredible people who have been so <laughs> resilient. And we've brought these two new incredible talents on board. Um, mm-hmm. And it's fun. It's challenging. It's scary. It's but I really believe. And actually, I will tell you, I can't really reveal much, but we are coming up with even an extension to the business model that is even more powerful um, that if it was, a, if it, you know, it just, if it wasn't a chain, a game changer before, and I actually think it was, it is totally going to be a game changer in terms of really upending the entire luxury category. And yeah. that to me is exciting. You know, for me, the world did not need another handbag brand, but the world definitely needed a better luxury handbag brand. Yeah. One that is uh, respectful of people on the planet and just completely upends the business model. And yeah. so I hope this That's is my exciting. swan song from a professional point of view. That's exciting. Now, I have a couple more questions. So how were you affected by COVID and how, and what have been your biggest obstacles and how did you overcome them in general? That doesn't have to be COVID related, but. Mm-hmm. Um, so affected by COVID, uh, you know, I mean, we immediately cut half our work staff. I, it was, I didn't even have to think about it. I just kind of had, we all had a sense where this was headed. Um so that was hard, but at least I could say that it wasn't because, you know, the business was failing, which is because we were rocking into a pandemic. Um, secondly, we did see a pretty dramatic depression of revenue. Um, okay. You know, because our bag, listen, our, we're not a really well-known brand yet, and we're not a stature brand. So if someone is looking to make the one purchase they're going to make in a year where everything was upended, you know, it was likely not going to be our brand. That said, our clients were incredibly supportive. We did, we had to bring some merchandise back from some other stores that we were in. And they, um, you know, we probably had our most successful sample sale ever in March of last year. Um, So we did have the, you know, we really had to and make up for revenue. Um, We also decided to pull out of our Nordstrom partnership for a number of reasons, strategic that um, make complete sense. And, on the heels of the fact that they had closed their doors. And then when they opened the doors, the traffic was just, a, 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 you know, down to a trickle. Um, so now we're back to a business currently that's online and supported by a stylist team that we're building in part mm-hmm. with some of the women that were our stylist at Nordstrom and revisiting now how we go back into a retail in a totally different format. Right. Um, but last year we definitely had a, you know, suppressed revenue outcome. We see it turning around quite a bit now. So the mask business, that was sort of an accidental invention um, really helped carry us through in terms of the top line. That's great. How do you, how does a small company make its way through an, an industry that's so gigundous? That's like, it's giant, right? Like it's a very, a market of giants say, right? So how do you, draw awareness how do you market what is a what have you found that works what's a good strategy because i know that there are a lot of women out there that have started or have an idea of maybe a skincare product or a beauty product or clothing or handbags or whatever it is right and it's a very i feel like not luxury i don't think is saturated but you've got some big giants in the industry, right? So how do you navigate the launch and marketing and getting your brand known? Um, So I could say three things about that. First, I don't think we did it well in the beginning. Um, (laughs) You learn, right? Like, yeah, you know, I'd like to say, I'd like to say that I did not think if we build it, they'll, they will come. But I kind of had the hope that if we build it, they will come. <laughs> uh, again, I, I, I hope is not a strategy, and I know that. But um, I honestly, you know, the research had really given us an indication that there was an audience for this, um, and there is an audience for this. But it is it is trying to find that audience. And so in the early days, you know, we we did a number of things, and we just didn't find the right hook or the right sparkle um, to really get that you know lightning in a bottle effect, if you will. Right. So there were a number of things we were doing, um, both in terms of online acquisition and, and to be honest, retail acquisition was more successful for us. And that's why we were in Nordstrom. We had a full 50-inch touchscreen customizer supported by a couple of stylists. 
a little bit of product on the shelves, nothing like you would have for a normal brand. It was actually a concession. So it was our shop and we paid a percent of sales to Nordstrom. Um, so we had control over the entire experience, including the employees were on our payroll. We merchandised the shop. We switched out product when we thought it was appropriate. Um, and so we started really just building it client by client. Um, but I will tell you, and I think overall, I would say that for our brand, it's really about a very different kind of personal relationship with the client, not just the experience they have on the customizer or at retail going through the customizer, but the experience we have with them and the relationship we have with them in its entirety. Um, and this is demonstrated or evidenced by the fact that we have like a 1% return rate on our custom product. So people, uh-huh. once they've gone through the experience and yes, invested a little bit of time and emotional um, energy and even, you know, overcoming obstacles or of uh, confidence that, you know, gosh, should I be designing my own bag? You know, where's Tom Ford when you need him? Um, <laughs> once you get over all that, then they're, they have this piece of art in their hands, this work of art that they co-designed, that they designed, and that we've, you know, translated into this beautiful piece for them. And so, A, we have an extraordinarily low return rate on our custom product, and really on all our product, but especially our custom product. And secondly, we have a very high repeat purchase rate. Um, mm-hmm. So we think it's important to invest in the acquisition and in the relationship. Mm-hmm. Um and then, you know, that serves us very well. So where we are today, and that's where our new chief marketing officer comes in, is we just have to do that a lot more. You know, we have to bring in a lot more clients because we know that when we have them, they are incredibly productive and prolific with us. Um, so we're putting a number of things into place. And, and I will say now, that's the other point I'm going to make. Um, actually, it was two other points. One is we know that the luxury consumer, the conventional luxury consumer, our core currently, if she's anywhere past 40 and has a closet full of those brands, she's ready for that next step. She can evaluate beautiful materials, exquisite craftsmanship, what she wants and likes in a piece. So she's ready to take that step. She's well-informed. And so we're trying to tease that marketplace to find those women um, and move them to their, we don't want to replace everything in their bag. We just want to play in their closet. We just want to place next to all the other brands in that closet. Mm-hmm. Um And the last thing I'll say is, you know, now we can say, I think unequivocally, that we are truly the only inherently sustainable luxury brand. And that's a complete uh, trump on any other luxury brand out there. They're all making very noble and I think worthwhile initiatives and sustainability. So I won't take any of that away. But just how just being natively custom, we can we start with a huge um, um, leap forward in that whole sustainability discussion. So that's becoming a real ace in the sword or what is it ace in the hand, if you will. And especially as we start thinking about those other audiences, because we know that the boomers and the sort of 40 plus category, the core luxury classical con- luxury consumer is going to continue to, you know, age out of the market. And so the gen X, Y, and Z are increasingly important. The numbers are astonishing how important they are, but they have different values, right? They care about sustainability. You know, I've had women walk away and say, you know, okay, whatever, you know, well, these people will care about it. They care about not having a branded piece. They really care about self-expression. They're digitally native. So they're really much more comfortable with this whole design online process and buy something that you've never seen before, um, you know, and put your credit card down. So on many levels, they're actually wired better for us as a client. And so I think, um, um, you know, we're incredibly, it's, it's been an amazing few months as we've seen the market just completely lean in our direction and we're right there to meet it. Yeah, I think that's awesome. That's fantastic. So if you were to give advice to other founders or entrepreneurs, what are three things or three pieces of advice that you would give? I mean, the first thing, the con- it's like my mother used to say about having babies, right? She always forgot how hard it was until the second one. And then she'd forget until the third one, you know, and then she'd say never again. And then she'd have a, and, and I kind of feel like that with startups, you know, like I forgot how hard it was. It's just hard. And somehow you have to project if you can and talk to other people to know that it's fun and exciting to be in control of your destiny and to be creative and, and do something that no one else has done. But very, I mean, go to, I will tell you, we got pretty lucky, but also we did not become Google, you know, so uh, we we had a great business and we raised, we built it over a billion dollars in revenue. We took it public and we sold it to Google for 1.6 billion. So, I mean, it was a huge success, 
but we should have been Google. And so I are, you know, I say, gosh, what did it take to become Google on many levels? And there's a whole different conversation there. Um, but man, we worked hard. We worked so hard. And then I came back to New York and I was flitting around and having so much fun. I'm going to start a company again. And then boom, you know, and I'm going to have a baby at the same time. Um, and then it's just hard. So you just, you want to just be go in open eyed. Um, secondly, for me, it's all about my network. Everything I have, I would say almost, almost every major hire and a lot of the luck that we've bumped into has been through the network. And I'm not actually even the best networker. I'm not, a, I'm social, but I'm not a socialite type person. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to all the events and things at night because that's my time with my daughter. Um, but I think leveraging that has really enabled us to survive and, and on many levels succeed. And it is, I already see that's the path to our future. Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess the third thing I would say is um, it really helps to start to do something where you already bring some kind of expertise and knowledge to the table and that you have a unique insight uh, and understanding of the category. Mm -hmm. Um, And that, and I'm only, and that's not just with luxury bags, although I think there are some unique insights um, that we bring to the table here that others have not at least the some of the early founders Um, but when i think about some of the medical tech companies that are out there and 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 many others you know it it, it can happen otherwise but you need somebody who just knows how to bring a special sauce that no one else has to give you that unfair competitive advantage right so how can we help you what can we do for you how can Mm. we help you succeed I mean, I think most importantly, uh, there's two things that we're focused on right now. One is really hitting revenue numbers. So we've been on a good track the last several months. And it's just critical that we keep showing big top line leaps every month Mm -hmm. as we start talking to investors. So whatever we can do to introduce folks to our brand at winatelier.com is incredibly helpful. Um, And we'll take good care of those relationships. And then secondly, we will start going out here soon. We're just evaluating our investor strategy and a few things to make sure we're well prepared um, for what would have been a series A. And, you know, folks might downgrade us a little bit here because we clearly lost some revenue in the last um, 14 months. But, you know, whether it's a late seed or series A, we're, we're going out and that will really be the gross capital for the next round. And so we're eager to meet investors who would have an interest in that. So where's the best resource that people should go? Should they go to the website? Is that the best place to, to buy, to customize and buy their one of a kind bag? It is. So com is the website. It's number one, A-T-E-L-I-E-R. Okay. Um, and we're very aware that this is a nurtured sale, usually a nurtured process, especially the first time. And so there's a few of us who are intrepid and are just going to go boom, 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 done. I've got my bag. And then there's the rest of us who get caught in the joy of designing. And, you know, I see them circling because you've got 25 bags in their wish list. Um, and so we often style this team who's an incredible group of women. So you can also access from our website a stylist and, and either, you know, talk on chat or invite um, and uh, ask for a stylist um, interview, I guess. And we'll, the stylist will guide you through that experience as well. So it sort of takes some of that pressure or cognitive load off and help people through the process. I'm sure they may have questions or what do you think of this versus this? Like which one, blah, 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 you know, all that fun stuff. Well, I'm so excited. I can't Absolutely. wait to get my own bag. I Thank have you. to go check it out. But anyway, I so appreciate your time. It's been absolutely fantastic having you on today. And if there's ever anything you need, feel free to reach out. Um, the community is here to support you. And good luck with raising funding. That's always an adventure. Um, yes. You may have to catch up again to hear all about the fundraising experiences. Thank you, Brooke. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Wild Feather. Be authentic, be limitless, and love yourself.